Why, hello there, and welcome back to Let's Make Us a Character. And in this episode, we'll be Let's Making Us a Character for Swords and Wizardry. Because I've literally had a copy sitting on my hard drive since 2012 and never really looked at it. Swords and Wizardry is by its own definition a restarted version of original Dungeons and Dragons, although more commonly known as a retro clone. And it is also part of the larger OSR thing that I'm not incredibly interested in, but as I said, I just kind of happen to have the book, so let's make us a Swords and Wizardry character. Character creation begins by rolling 3d6 each for our Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma. Our race options are Human, Dwarf, Elf, Half-Elf, and Halfling. And our class options are Assassin, Cleric, Druid, Fighter, Magic User, Monk, Paladin, Ranger, and Thief. Also, the class options for non-human characters are very restricted. And this time we are going to do something that I wanted to do in the original Dungeons & Dragons video, but the rules for it were so poorly explained that I just didn't bother. That's right, we are multiclassing. And of our multi-class options, Elven Fighter slash Magic User is the most iconic, so let's go with that. And I may or may not have manipulated the attribute rolls in order to get numbers that made a good Fighter slash Magic User. As an Elven Fighter Magic User, we are restricted to 4 levels of Fighter and 8 levels of Magic User. Unless we have really high Strength or Intelligence, which could raise it to 6 and 9. Our Strength of 14 sets our chance to open doors at 2 and 6, gives us a plus 10 carry modifier, and a plus 1 bonus to 2 hit rolls for fighters, which is half of what we are. However, our Strength is not high enough for a damage bonus, and the penalties for low Strength apply to all characters. Strength is also the prime attribute for fighters, which normally gives a 5% experience bonus if over 12, but those bonuses do not apply to multi-classed characters. Our dexterity of 15 gives us a plus one bonus to missile attacks and makes our AC better by one. And it is phrased in that weird way for a specific reason that we will get to later. Our constitution of nine sets our chance of surviving raised dead at 75%, but is not high or low enough for a hit point modifier. Our intelligence of 12 gives us three additional languages in addition to common, so let's take Elvish, Goblin, and Giantish, just because that one sounds kind of silly. Our intelligence also sets our maximum spell level at 6. Unfortunately, as an elf, our max spell level is capped at 5. Our chance to understand new spells is 55%, and our minimum and maximum spells understandable per level are 4 and 6, and I'll explain most of that later. Wisdom does not provide any bonuses other than a 5% experience bonus if over 12, which does stack with prime attribute bonuses even from Wisdom, but once again does not apply to multi-class characters. And our Charisma of 8 sets our maximum number of Special Hirelings at 3, and like Wisdom, provides an Experience bonus if over 12, which is a nice little something to give characters for High Wisdom or Charisma who aren't Wisdom or Charisma based. As an Elf, we get Dark Vision 60 feet, a 1 in 6 chance to detect secret doors just kinda whenever, and a 4 in 6 chance to detect them when we're actually looking, and also immunity to Ghoul Paralysis. As a first level fighter, we have the ability to make a number of attacks each round equal to our level, but only against creatures with one or fewer hit dice. We also get a parrying ability based on our dexterity, which in our case gives a minus two penalty to enemy attacks against us. And a fighter saving throw of 14, and this is a moderate change from the original, now you have a single saving throw value instead of separate saving throws for death ray or poison, wands, turning to stone, dragon's breath, and staves and spells. Although they do still include the original rules for those who want to use them. As a first level magic user, we get one spell per day and a spell book containing as many as eight first level spells. So I guess... Eight, then? 
but we also need to roll to determine if we can understand the spells in our spellbook, rolling against our chance to understand new spells value, which is 55. And it seems that we understand Detect Magic, Magic Missile, and Sleep. Now, we also have a minimum spells understandable per level of 4, and I do not know what that means. I looked all over the damn internet, and the closest thing I could find to an answer was, it's up to the Game Master's interpretation. And I guess that's me, so let's say we can reroll each spell until we reach 4. So let's reroll Read Magic, because that one's important, and we understood it and are now at 4. We also start with a magic user saving throw of 15, with a plus 2 bonus on saves against spells. But what do we do with two saving throw values, you ask? Excellent question! As a multi-class character, we use the best saving throw from our two classes for the given situation. And since we want to roll equal to or under, most of the time that would be our fighter saving throw. However, our magic saving throw gets a plus two bonus against spells, so when subjected to a spell, that would be the better value. And if you think that's odd, here's how you determine hit points. A fighter gets 1d8 hit points at first level, and a magic user gets 1d4. So a fighter magic user gets the average of 1d8 and 1d4. And the average of 4 and 4 is 4. And now for alignment, our options being Lawful, Neutral, and Chaotic. And let's just go Lawful, because for some reason something always seems intrinsically lawful to me about book magic. And now for equipment. We get 3d6 times 10, so 70 gold. And let's get a longbow, 20 arrows, and some very modest adventuring essentials. Then we calculate our weight, and notably, miscellaneous equipment weighs 10 pounds, which is a bit of an overestimation right now, but will be a convenient underestimation later. And we are well within the base 75 pound carrying capacity, especially because we have a plus 10 bonus, so it's actually 85. Which means our base movement rate is 12. Now, you may have noticed that we did not buy any armor, and there is a reason for that. As a fighter slash magic user, we get the weapon and armor proficiencies of both fighter and magic user, which means we can use any weapons and armor because that's what fighters can do. However, we cannot use magic while wearing non-magical armor, so it's either magic or armor, and I choose magic. So now to calculate our attacks and armor class, and we are actually going to use some alternate rules. The base rules, like the original game, use the low is good descending armor class system, with big tables of two hit numbers for the various classes at specific levels against specific armor classes. But they also provide a system of ascending AC and two hit modifiers, which is inarguably the single best update in the history of the game, and is what we will be using, because I am a very big proponent of not having to look up something on a table if you don't have to. So with no armor, our AC is 10, plus 1 for our dexterity, and that's why it says better by 1, because it's either plus 1 or minus 1, depending on which AC system you're using. Our attack modifier is plus 0 for both fighter and magic user. I couldn't find specifics on which attack bonus or two hit modifiers to use for multi-class characters, so I'm going to assume it's like the saves and you always use the better one. We get plus one for our strength, and the rules do specify that by default that applies to missile weapons, and also that it stacks with the plus one from our dexterity, so plus two overall. And our bow does 1d6 damage, has a range of 70 feet, and a rate of fire of two, which is the maximum number of attacks that can be made with the weapon per round. And this character is done, and right about now you're probably thinking, multi-class characters are pretty dang awesome which they are, but do have some significant disadvantages. So let's say we've done some adventuring and gained 2,000 experience points, the amount required to reach second level as a fighter. Except that all of our experience points are divided between our two classes. So let's say we get another 2,000 experience points, giving us enough to level up in fighter. Our saving throw drops to 13, our two hit bonus does not go up, which is normal, and we do not get a hit die, which is different. 
So another 1000 experience points later, and we have enough to level up in Magic User. We get one more spell per day, our Magic User save drops to 14, and according to the rules at the GM's discretion, we can try to understand the spells we fail during character creation. And we have hit our maximum level 1 spells. And now we do get a second hit die, or the average of 2. But now let's go into the future, where we've reached level 4 in both classes, which is the maximum fighter level allowed for an elf. We can no longer advance in fighter, but still have to keep splitting our experience points, with further levels in fighter only serving to determine when we gain a hit die. So when we get to level 5 in both classes, we gain a hit die, but none of the fighter advancements. And that was a Swords and Wizardry character. Basically, the original Dungeons & Dragons white box, plus supplements, with a few minor tweaks and better explained rules. Well, the supplements excluding the Bard class from the magazine, and maybe that's something to take a look at in a future video. And it's, uh... Okay, honestly, retro clones in general are a thing that I don't really see the point of. Like, it's a better version of that game, but... Is that really the best version of the game? I really don't care. These are literally games we are talking about. Play whatever you want, just don't be a jerk about it. And thank you for watching, with extra special thanks to my Fightin' Flail Snails, Samuel Gorski, Randy Maholland, and SC Woolridge, as well as my other patrons. If you'd like to be cool like them, check out my Patreon, where you can get early access to videos and fun stuff that I make for the Patreon. And if you don't want to do that, that's cool too. You can still hit all the lovely buttons, like, subscribe, these other videos, which I am sure are lovely videos. And until next time, keep on rolling.